I found throughout my career that of the oceanographic disciplines, physical oceanography tends to be a little underrepresented and underappreciated. And so when I talk to a multidisciplinary audience like today, I like to explain just what we do and why. Um, so, from climate to a group of sandwich, physical oceanography covers a wide range of topics. Uh, grouper is a reef fish in Florida. I don't know what the comparable fish is here, but it actually it's a, it's a delicious fish no matter how you cook it. You can grow it, you can fly it. You would make a poker fish out of it. Um, and we really wouldn't have it were it not for the ocean physics, as, as you'll see. Um, I also found out in walking over the last few days why so many Jewish people moved to Florida. Um, the, the geology is very similar to Israel, so it's all limestone. <laughs> so that was a, a good revelation for me. Okay. So, what is physical oceanography? Well, it's the application of physics to the study of the ocean and how the ocean circulation works, how the ocean and the atmosphere interact, and how all of this gives rise to climate. So, why is it important? Well, from a very general perspective, the foundation of Earth's climate and ecology is the ocean circulation. So while philosophers may argue to find forms of existentialism, this uh, oceanography is simply existential. We wouldn't be here if we were not for the ocean physics. From a more practical sense, we, you know, we, we think we're environmentalists. We like to be good stewards of the environment. Well, unless we understand how that natural system really works, we really can't be responsible environmental stewards. So, um, we really want to manage something properly, we have to know how it works. So that's why we're studying the ocean circulation. Okay, so my talk is, I'm going to begin from a global perspective. I'll talk a little bit about, about climate, a little bit about ecology, and, and then I'll get down to a local perspective. I work on the West Florida continental shelf, and uh, we'll talk about applications to harmful algal blooms, Gag grouper recruitment and to fish lesions that were found uh, after the deep water rise in the oil spill. And we'll see if we can explain these different phenomena. So let's start with a global perspective. And I'd like to begin by looking at a picture of the Earth from space with all of the clouds and all the water <coughs> omitted. And that's what you see. And so, um, You'll see very verdant regions and very arid regions and some ice covered regions. Why does it look like that? Well, if we add the clouds and the water, we see why it looks that way. So, where there's verdant regions, you have clouds, and where there's arid regions, you have no clouds. And um, so, the climate on the land on which we live determined by the ocean atmosphere interactions. And how does that come about? Well, um, you know, the Earth is a sphere, it's heated by the sun, the sun radiates at a certain temperature, the Earth radiates at a much lower temperature, so we have incoming shortwave radiation from the sun, and outgoing longwave radiation from the Earth. Um, since the Earth is spherical, you see most of that incoming shortwave radiation in the tropics, and since the temperature doesn't vary that much from the equator to the poles, we radiate pretty much uniformly uh, across the entire Earth. And so you might, from that description, realize that there's a, a, an imbalance locally between what's coming in and what's going out. And the way to mitigate that imbalance is you have to move heat, you have to transfer heat. And that's why we have ocean currents, and that's why we have wind. In fact, it's the only reason why we have ocean currents and wind. So the ocean currents and the wind are nature's way of maintaining some energy balance on the Earth. So 
given that the coupled ocean atmosphere system determines climate as we know it, uh, what can we say about ecology? So what the ocean circulation does is it unites nutrients with light that fuels primary productivity and vents all higher trophic level um, interactions. And so along with climate, ecology also begins with the ocean circulation. So let's take a look at the Earth from space again. And the green regions are regions where there are plants, and the blue regions are regions where there are no plants. And so every place where you see green in the ocean can be explained by the ocean circulation. So in other words, plants only exist in the ocean where the ocean circulation permits them to exist. I always like to point out this line on the equator. It's as if someone took a paintbrush and painted a nice purple line in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. That's because we have a divergence of fluid on the equator. It has to be replaced by water from below, which brings the thermocline and the neutrocline very close to the surface, so it's within the lighted zone. And so plants can grow, it's both nutrients and light. If we look at this region here and that region there, that's at the northern end of the subtropical gyre, again, where the thermocline, which is very deep in the middle, comes up like a pole. And where it comes up near the surface, which is right over here, right over here, you can grow plants. Again, nutrients are introduced into the light itself. And I can look around any other place on this map and provide a physical oceanographic explanation for why the plants are growing. Okay, so um, without, without the circulation, there would be no ecology. All right, so um, let's now move on to a local perspective. And Again, there'll be three different examples, multiple algal blooms, gag group of recruitment, and an explanation of why lesions were found on fish after the deep water rise in oil spill. So on the West Florida continental shelf, so here's, oops, here's Florida. I live right over there somewhere. Yeah, right there. Okay. Yeah. Right there. Okay. So um, this is Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, two major estuaries on the west coast of Florida. And we tend to get harmful algal blooms that seem to be concentrated in here. Sometimes they extend down to here. But rarely do we see them here. And um, so to study these things, we use a combination of, of moorings with Instrumentation going from here down to the bottom and surface meteorology on the top. And we apply models. So this is what we call our West Florida Coastal Ocean Model. It's a very high resolution circulation model that receives its open boundary values along here from another model which is run by the US Navy called HICOM. So we get our deep ocean forcing from the HICOM our local forcing from winds and rivers and heat flux, and we try to simulate the circulation on the West Florida shelf. So the, the reason I approach it this way is that the sampling problems are going, so there's never enough data. And so you've got to have a model to dynamically interpolate the limited set of data. But models um, without data are frankly more or less useless. Some of my model friends and theoreticians will argue with me about that point, but um, somehow you've got to constrain. There are so many sources of error that can creep into a model, even if it's a perfect model, um, because it still depends on boundary conditions if the error is the boundary conditions. So even a perfect model with the error prone, our models are very far from perfect. So unless you have data to do two different things, one, provide some veracity test for the model. And two, uh, assimilate into the 
model to actually improve the simulations. Unless you can do that, at least one or both, the models become less than, than useful. So our approach is to try to do both. <coughs> All right, so harmful algorithms. We have a toxic dinoflagellate called Corinthiogrippus. Um, it's named after a lady named Karen, a wonderful lady, I know her. She has studied red tides off of Florida forever. And this is a really noxious um, uh, harmful algae. Uh, I always feel bad every time I call it Corinthiogrippus because Karen's a very nice lady. I don't know why. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's the beast out of She's proud of it, so that's okay. Um, so we find that these occur along Florida's west coast and primarily between Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor, as we just pointed out. They're there all the time in some low concentration, but some years we get these tremendous blooms, and, and they're really terrible. They, they cough and they can't breathe and they kill fish and it stinks and it's uh, not very nice. But it doesn't happen every year. It happens interactively, not angrily, as made blooms. So why are the blooms interactual instead of annual? Why are they preferentially found between Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor? And um, can we look at specific years and explain the behavior in those years? Um, Cardiac brevis, I'm told, also occurs here. In fact, it occurs in many places around the world, and it requires what are called oligotropic conditions, which means nutrient uh, deeply. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit more. So those are the questions. And this is a, kind of a complicated plot, but <clears throat> we have in the Gulf of Mexico, it's called the Gulf of Mexico loop current. It comes in through the Yucatan Strait, loops around, goes out the Florida Straits, and heads north as the Gulf Stream. So the loop current is the precursor of the Gulf Stream. And sometimes the loop current can go way up here. And other times it does what you see. It just stays close to the in, in, inflow of outflow ports. So in 2010, this, this is May of 2010, this is December, just looking at a time series of, of such plots. In 2010, around May, the loop current shed what's called an eddy. So it, it had penetrated pretty far into the Gulf of Mexico, and it let loose this eddy. And then it retreated back to the inflow outflow ports and stayed that way through December. When it does that, it comes in contact with a set of islands over here, the last one being the Dry Tortugas, which is positioned right about there. And when it does that, it comes in contact with shallow water isobaths. When it's up here, it doesn't hit any shallow water. So there is a basic theorem in, in fluid mechanics um, called the Taylor Problem Theorem. And you can argue from, on the basis of the physics behind the tail problem theorem that fluid likes to flow along lines of constant depth. It's very difficult to take fluid in a column this thick and squeeze it up onto the shelf in a column this thick, both from mass conservation and angular momentum conservation arguments. And because of that, we have another concept, it's a length scale called the Rossby radius of deformations. Because of those same principles, if you touch the continental shelf with a strong current like the new current, and you put a, a pressure perturbation, a little hump in pressure on the shelf slope, that effect will only migrate in by what we call a Rossby radius deformation. So if the loop current happens to hit, say over here, like this, it's only going to affect. very short distance in. But if it hits here, the contact shallow isobaths. And so its effect can be felt across the entire continental shelf. So this is a very special place. And we, we refer to it as a pressure 
touch the pressure point, you're going to feel it across the entire West Florida shelf. So when it does that, it sets up a current across the whole shelf. And the long and short of it is that you wind up upwelling new water onto the shelf from the deep ocean. That new water has relatively high nutrient content. And those high nutrients can favor other phytoplankton, such as diatoms, over the Crenny Brevis dinoflagellates. Okay, so we can model that too. So here's a, an example from the model simulation. This plot on the near bottom currents, these vectors, and near bottom temperature. You can see that in July of 2010, when it was awfully hot in Florida, the bottom temperature in the ocean was relatively cool. And so the pathway of cold, nutrient-rich water is like that. You can see it in the directionality of these vectors. And so we were vecting relatively cold, relatively high nutrient water right up to the coastal zone which suppressed the ability of the climate crevice to grow. Now, my, as I said, models without data aren't very really useful, so we have to see if that model simulation makes any sense. This was a glider transect taken in July, and um, this is temperature, uh, salinity, chlorophyll, and uh, dissolved colored organic matter. You can see the chlorophyll is all on the bottom. This is the base of the neutrocline in the deep ocean, and this was high nutrient water that got ejected onto the West Water Shelf. You can see the, in the temperature that cold water <coughs> coming right up to the near shore. So the model did capture what was going on, so we can use the model. Um, this is Temperature records from a mooring or a set of moorings. And just look at the bottom temperature. The red is observation, the green is the model simulation. We more or less did okay. Uh, we didn't get everything right, but we more or less did okay uh, for temperature throughout that year. And then these are currents. This is a year's worth of velocity vectors observed at mid depth in the middle of the shelf, more or less. You can see all these, this southward flow, which is an upwelling oriented flow. And um, this is the simulation. And so, you know, this all looks about the same, except the simulation is a little bit anemic, it's a little bit lower in magnitude, but the fluctuations and the general sense of the flow are pretty good. And so, we could use the model to describe what happened in that year because there's a, a reasonable fidelity between the observations and the model. All right, so this is what happened. Um, K. brevis is a slow-growing dinoflagellate, generally outcompeted by fast growing diatoms. So it, it can only bloom under oligotropic conditions when the diatoms don't have enough nutrients to, uh, to grow. In 2010, there was this upwelling of new nutrient-rich water, which favored the diatoms over the Crania brevis, and so we didn't have a bloom in 2010. The reason why Tampa Bay to Charlotte Harbor is the terminus, um, it is the preferred region for Crania brevis, is that it is the terminus of the injection of fluid from the deeper ocean to the coast, and it passes right over the former region for the Crane Brevis Red Tide, which we believe is mid shelf, pretty much to the north of uh, northwest of Tampa Bay. And finally, um, given the logic behind the bloom that we saw in 2010, or the lack of bloom in 2010, we applied that logic successfully to predict that there would be no major bloom in 2013 um, and then a major one in 2014. So the physical oceanography, by virtue of injecting nutrients onto the shelf, seems to 
recently, but we first saw it there when we started to break the surface. And as time went on, it migrated down to here. So the color coding is the age of the observation. So um, this is when it was observed. Red is uh, it was observed uh, like a month ago. So the the um, evolution was from here to here. So these cells that were observed a month before these wound up over here. And we can continue along in that manner, and you can see that, um, that like this patch, that patch, and that patch, it's all basically the same observation, just at a different time. And so what started out over here, wound up going to here, over to here, and so on. And so um, we were able to try to simulate that with the model by putting particles in the model, either at the surface or at the bottom. And so if we put particles along the bottom over here, this is the color coding is depth. So if we put them on near the bottom at the 30 meter isobath over here, they all linked to the southeast and upwell at the surface. And so that followed the trajectory of the observed Perennium brevis that went from here to here. On the other hand, if we initiate and initialize our particles near the surface, they went offshore. And so what we learned is that the pathway of a blue Perennium brevis to beach from the midshell <coughs> is the bottom. And then they go in what's called the bottom Eckerd layer, which is a frictional boundary layer along the bottom. So again, we can explain the evolution of the primary brevis, not the biological part, but the physical part by the ocean circulation. All right, let's move on to another topic. So after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, fishermen started catching fish with lesions on the skin and other deformities. Um, and this was where the oil was seen on the surface, but also off the west coast of Florida, where no oil was visible on the surface. So why do we have fish lesions? So that we see any oil. Okay, so this is renditions of where the oil was in 2010, uh, put together by NOAA. And so the red are places where satellite imagery and aircraft overflights observe surface oil. Um, on the 21st of June, 26th of June, 27th and 29th of June. And so you can see that the oil at the surface got as far as this point of land. But it didn't go any farther. We never saw any surface oil off the west coast of Florida. So what we did is we took our West Florida Coastal Ocean model and we initialized oil in the model domain where we saw it in the satellite imagery. Remember, it didn't come past this point. So this is what this was our initialization on the 19th of June 2010. And I'm not going to go into the details of how we dealt with the flux of oil on and off, but we tried to do that in a way that made physical sense. And the next plot then is a movie, next slide would be a movie loop of where that stuff went. The argument we made is that if you have oil at the surface, some of it's going to get mixed down. Because a lot of the oil you see at the surface, very, very small particle sizes. Sheen, for example, has it's on the scale of micrometers, and uh, most of the particle sizes are millimeters or smaller. And so that stuff can very easily get mixed down. In fact, if we back up a little bit from this panel to this panel, a mere two days, we go from seeing a lot of stuff on the surface to all of a sudden it's all kind of gone. Where did it go? Well. It didn't disappear. It got mixed down in the water column. 
So we can make the argument that if we did see oil, let's say over here, then a lot of that oil would have been mixed through oil. Okay, so the argument is that some of that stuff got uniformly distributed across the board column. And if that's the case, and this is where it went. So the color coding is concentration. We start off with a concentration of one, just an arbitrary normalized number. And then we allow that concentration to decrease simply by advection and mixing. And so the concentration is given on a log scale above. And you can see the pathway in which that oil would have taken beneath the surface and how the concentration would have rapidly diminished, but nonetheless, there would have been oil on the West Water Shelf. So we can go ahead and sample this at a couple of different times and look at what the concentrations were. And so um, purple is 0.05. So even even down to here, we're having numbers like 0.05. So we make some estimate of what the initial concentration was, and then allow that to become further diluted. We would still come up with several parts per billion, which is enough over a period of time to have an adverse impact on the fish. And so um, a colleague of mine is a fisheries biologist, and he went out and did a bunch of sampling a year later. 2011, and those red dots are where he found fish with deformities and with lesions. And if you compare that distribution with the previous movie, uh, the previous movie pretty much explains why there were fish with lesions throughout the West Water Shelf. By the way, these were reef fish, so they don't swim around. They have a set of rocks they like to live under and they stay there. And so it's not that the fish swam from up here to here, it's these fish kind of stay where they are. It's the water swam from up there to here with low concentrations of oil uh, that have hydrocarbons in them that gave rise to the lesions. Okay, so I think I just said that. But oil did go to the West Water Shelf, but it was sight unseen beneath the surface. I have some colleagues in my college that they call themselves satellite oceanographers. And um, they look at color and they look at temperature, and from that they explain everything that's going on on the earth, um, on the earth facetious. But um, I'm sure you have people here, that's what everybody goes on here with too. Um, not everything happens at the surface, that's the point I'm making. In fact, I think most ecology begins below the surface, because that's where the nutrients are. And so it's very important as oceanographers that we look beyond... Um, uh, I, my favorite movie used to be The Usual Suspects, starring Kevin Spacey. <laughs> but I can't say that anymore. <laughs> it was still a great movie. But in that movie, the reason I liked it so much is, is they looked for the usual suspects, and of course they missed the perpetrator of the crime, who ironically is Kevin Spacey. So, uh, okay, so we need to look at the surface as well as at the surface. All right, let's move on to gag river recruitment. So, here's the basic problem with Gag Group. Right? It's a wonderful fish. It lives as adults, or, or it spawns as adults at the shelf break, the city of the shelf break. The juveniles are found near shore, in the estuaries. They grow up in, in grass beds. Well, the juveniles, when they're being transported, they're, you know, like that. They can't swim. So how do they get from 100 kilometers offshore to the beach? That was always a mystery. All right, so here's a, a map 
Um, we think that they spawn in here. In fact, these are two protected areas. There's another protected area. And so the, the adults spawn out to here, generally in the winter, or from winter to early spring. And um, some 40 to 70 days later, the juveniles arrive. Um, oops. The juveniles arrive around here. And again, just like Cronia brevis, the preferred juvenile sediment area is over here, and also is over here, but not in here, and not down here. So, um, how do they get from spawning to sediment? So we address this with a numerical circulation model after we were able to demonstrate that the model simulation looked sufficiently like the data so that we could use a model simulation. All right, well, this is what, uh, this is what they look like. This is a, a young uh, gag. And here's a, a time series from April 1st to June 17th of the appearance of these guys on the beach. And when I say on the beach, the sampling was done right here, a place called Mel Key. And as you can see, they, they came in Just a couple of, well, there were none of them, and all of a sudden a few of them, now a whole bunch, and then back down to zero. So we, we have a very good tag on, on when the juveniles arrived. We know from previous studies that in biology it takes 40 to 70 days to do it, and we also know from our physical geographic studies that a month and a half, more or less, is. Under our bond conditions, it's the time it takes to move a particle from the shelf wave to the beach. Um, by the way, there's an interesting story here. I think I got this one. Um, so, a colleague of mine who's a, who did the sampling came to my office with a bucket of water. And he walked in with his bucket of water, placed it on the floor, put his hand in it, and took out that fish. And he said, Hey, Bob, I just got this on Mall of Key. <laughs> And in his hand was also a piece of macroalgae. Um, I don't know macroalgae from a piece of lettuce, but it was a green thing. And he said, and it's co-located with macroalgae of deeper hard bottom origin. So it wasn't a piece of seaweed that floated at the surface. It was also a piece of seaweed that came from the bottom. And so we had two pieces of information, the, the gag juvenile and, and a piece of lettuce that he surfed in on uh, uh, to get to the beach. All right, so at, at that point we set off to do this um, to do this experiment. So remember I talked about the loop current. And, and so here's the loop current. Here's an eddy. This happens to be in April of 2007. So. In April of two, the April and May 2007, the loop current was hitting the shelf break near the dry tortugas, and you can see these velocity <coughs> vectors coming down from the north, driven by this interaction of the loop current with the shelf slope. We see it in April, we see it in May, and so we know that the loop current was impacting shelf circulation at that time. We happen to have uh, some moorings out there, and so uh, this is an observation. This is a model simulation uh, near the surface, near the bottom, and for the period of time that we're concerned with, you can see that the currents simulated, the currents observed, look very similar. Maybe the amplitude's off by a little bit, but we do have confirmation that there was a strong upwelling oriented circulation going on at that particular time, owing to the loop current interactions with 
show <coughs> slope near the dry protuberance. So here's a, a model simulation averaged over the month of um, April. There's a near bottom currents, and averaged over the month of May. The major upwelling event was in April throughout the entire month. And in May, we don't see it out here anymore, but at least we see it near the beach. And so if you look at these vectors carefully, you follow the trajectories, you can see where they head. And so the directionality of the near bottom currents, again, owing to the physics of the bottom boundary layer, what we call the Ekman layer, um, suggest that anything that was near the bottom up here would have ended up over here. So let's see how that worked. All right, so we, we positioned a bunch of mutually buoyant particles. Actually, we constrained the particles to stay in the bottom layer of the, of the model simulation here. So we positioned a bunch of particles at first at the surface, um, beginning on, well, this is, all of these begin on April 7th, and they run for 45 days. These are initialized at 40 meter isobat, 60, 80, 100 meter isobat. And what you see is none of these particles gained any proximity to the shore. They all either went offshore farther or just stayed along the same isobat, but none of them gained any distance to the shore. So if you were a little fish at the surface, you would simply have been eaten by a bigger fish because you never would have made it to settlement if you were moving along the surface. However, if we now look near the bottom and do the same experiment, release a bunch of particles along the 40 meter isobath, 60 meter isobath, 80 meter isobath, 100 meter isobath, they all head toward the settlement region. In fact, some of them actually uh, go right there. <laughs> so, near bottom particles all made it toward the beach. Near surface particles, none of them gained any proximity to the beach. And we repeated this uh, at a lot of different initial times. So there's nothing special about April 7th, it's just the one I chose to show. Um, and so we solved the group of recruitment problem. The mode of transport from offshore spline to nearshore settlement for GAG juveniles is via an upwelling circulation um, within the bottom and the layer. So they literally come from spline to settlement along the bottom, not near the surface. Curiously, um, Fisheries biologists go out all the time with nets and they, they tow these nets and most of their toes are near the surface. Or if they tow across the whole water column, there's a lot of rocks in the bottom. So they don't, they don't like the nets to get too close to the bottom because they, they would get snagged. And so we don't have evidence from these very long surveys of, of fish eggs and larvae because they just weren't sampled in the right place. And so hopefully now um, the sampling strategy will change and we'll get some more data on it. We do have good data on settlement, we do have good data on, on spawning, but the pathway data was, was missing. Um, the thought is that the eggs are buoyant, so the eggs do come to the surface for a brief period of time, but within days the, the, uh, the juveniles then migrate down toward the bottom. All right, the interesting thing, point to make, is just like the Cape Brevis Red Tide, there's a spatial order to ecology on the West Florida Shelf. We don't find the same things everywhere. Some things are here, and some things are there. And there's a reason for it. And the reason for it, again, is the ocean circulation. For two reasons. The circulation determines the water properties in which organisms reside. And the circulation also determines the transport pathways taken by the water and the organisms. 
So the region Tamarnator Shaw Park is such a special place because fluid that's upwelled across the shell break to the north ends up between Tampa Bay and, and Shoal Park. Okay, so let me offer a few conclusions. From the most general perspective, the circulation as a foundation for both climate and ecology is existential. We wouldn't be here if we were not for the ocean circulation. <clears throat> From a regional perspective, addressing coastal ocean ecology requires a multidisciplinary systems science approach. Ecology is not just biology. Ecology is the sum of all processes responsible for an organism to make a living. I mean, you're all organisms. You're all going to make a living. But, um, so everything that's necessary for you to make a living, like sitting through the seminar, is part of your ecology. Um, so the sooner we adapt our science strategy to accommodate this fact, the sooner we will better understand the processes that determine coastal ocean ecology, thereby becoming better environmental stewards of this very special region where society literally meets the sea. And finally, a Shakespearean perspective, to be oligotropic or not to be oligotropic, that is the question. And the answer lies within the ocean situation. So thank you for your attention. I'll try to answer any questions. Now. Uh, if the existential part is correct, if you will, and that's what we're following back, uh, even if you didn't have ocean circulation, presumably you would have a narrow belt of latitudes in which climate would be very similar to today. In other words, the tropics would be much hotter and the uh, poles would be much colder. But in between, we still probably have a region, maybe much narrower than today, in which we could live. So it's not 100% existential. But going back to the world, that's the problem. But going back to the right place to go. Okay. <laughs> uh, going back to the West Florida um, oceanography, you showed us two examples in which uh, the uh, fish and uh, algae, algae uh, indicated that there's a very strong upwelling. Uh, in other words, the uh, surface currents move offshore mostly, or less, less, um, uh, how should I say it? The bottom of the water moves onshore, and therefore there must be a composite offshore. Flow back at the surface, which is less visible in your data. But the oil spill uh, shows just the opposite. That the surface water goes onshore, so it must be a downwell down along the flow of the coast. Are these two events related to what? To the loop current? To the loop current? Yeah, in 2005, 2007, we had upwell in 2010. Right, so we had a downwell. Yeah. Okay. So upwelling arises due to two different forcing functions. One being the loop current interacting with the shell slope, which drives a prolonged southward flow along the West Florida coastline. And by virtue of the bottom friction, it causes, if I have a current flowing this way at mid-depth, it's going to turn to the left and flow towards the coast at the bottom. So the loop current can force that, as it did in 2010 from May through the end of the year, and during that brief period of time that I showed in 2007. You can also get upwelling by wind. So if the winds are blowing from north to south, that's an upwelling favorable wind, which will drive surface water away from the coastline, bottom water toward the coastline. Those two things are both important. The time over which upwelling will persist under wind forcing is short relative to the time over which upwelling will persist with a, a deep ocean interaction. So during the oil spill, the oil, oil spill started in April of 2010. The prolonged upwelling began around May 20th. It was, it was my birthday 
most of this. Um, and so from April 10 through May 20, a lot of oil was able to get toward the shore. Um, the, the winds were quite variable throughout that time. There were periods of time with strong downwind incredible winds, periods of time with upwind incredible winds, and then we had the deep ocean interactions going on. So everything was happening at once. And um, so it's, it's hard to attribute, it's hard to generalize over the whole period of time exactly what was happening. I am going to give a talk in Tel Aviv in, a, in a two weeks that will attempt to explain how the oil got to the beach along North Florida. Um, and again, it was a combination. Not only, not only was the, the, the circulation important, but the waves were also important. <clears throat> so I don't know if that's a, a completely satisfactory answer, but it is. Yeah, it's, it's okay. yeah. Is there any influence of the biology over the simulation? Or you can just treat them as particles? That's a good. That, that, oh, well. The biology probably does have an influence on the circulation because it changes how far the radiation can penetrate. So if you have green water versus blue water, the radiation will get trapped close to the surface. So you, you could change the structure of the thermocline to some degree by, biologically. Um, I think that's a lesser impact than the, the rest of the force and function. But Nonetheless, it does happen. It's still in place. Um, the, all I talked about today was for the circulation, you can largely neglect it, yes. However, for the biology, of course, you can't neglect it. It's very important. All I showed was the physical impact on the movement of, of water, particles, and nutrients. <clears throat> but of course, the biological equations have all kinds of interactions that are complicated and to do a real good job of a better job of describing the evolution of say current environments or any other for that matter, yeah you've got to have the biology in there as well. But what I'm what I'm suggesting today is that the underpinning for all that, the foundation for all that is the circulation. And then you have a lot more details obviously which I didn't talk about at all. But you raise a really good point. Um, I don't know about history, but in the United States there's a lot of interest in what they call ecological modeling. I'm sure you have that here too. So, how many, how many people in the room are big fans of numerical weather forecasting? Well, we depend on it, right? So we better be. So, we have to solve seven different equations <clears throat> to predict what? And, he, and these equations, you know, they have some parameters that we guess at, that we don't really fully understand, the mixing processes, and so on. So we, we have these parameters. We, we choose values for them, and on the basis of that, we, we predict what? We also have a lot of data that can be assimilated into the model. So we have seven equations, not too many parameters, and lots of data. And we can do a reasonable job, but still, you know, it's not that great. For Corinna Brevis, my buddies, my biological buddies tell me, you know, we really need like 30 state variables, maybe 40, because it's a very complicated critter. Even the simplest of the phytoplankters, you know, you need maybe um, 10 additional state variables. Oh, and by the way, a lot of parameters, not just like in, 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 in uh, weather prediction. And these parameters are also in exponential functions. And so if you make a small error in that parameter, you can make a huge error in the prediction. Oh, and by the way, we have very little data. And so if numerical weather prediction is a difficult problem, I contend that ecological modeling is an impossible problem. And we can do it retrospectively. You know, we can tune the model to come up with the answer that we observed. So in hindcast, we can probably do a pretty good job of 
figuring things out. But for a forecast, I, I frankly, I don't think it's possible, um, given the types of observations we're presently making. So we have to apply a concept you know, that we refer to as Occam's razor. We have to choose the simplest way of predicting something if we're going to be successful at it. And so that's what our, that's what our approach was. If, if I can argue that perennial brevis, you can usually get it right, not all the time, but you can usually get a major bloom right if we can simply determine whether or not the coastal ocean is oligotrophic or not oligotrophic, then we can do a, a reasonable job of prediction. We won't always be correct, but more times than not, we will be. Um, our argument looking at 25 years of satellite altimetry data and determining when the loop current hits the dry tortures or not, um, 19 out of those 25 years in Hindcast, we got the major blooms correct. Um, uh, when, and then the other years we, we, we weren't correct. So, you know, the biology is not unimportant, it's obviously important, but the underpinning the foundation, I think, is the ocean simulation. Understand correctly, you assume that it's a passive tracer. Yes. So, and um, even buoyant passive tracer. Um, no, not buoyant. Just neutral buoyant. Neutral. Yeah. So, do you think it's assumptions? I mean, the oil is lighter than the water, and also if there are processes that affect the spin. Correct. No, that, that, that's, a, that's a very good comment. If the particle size is small enough, which they generally are, the particle size is small enough, the oil, for all intents and purposes, is dissolved in the fluid. So if it's dissolved in the fluid, or the particle size is small enough to effectively be dissolved in the fluid, you can treat it as a passive, neutrally buoyant tracer. The bigger piece is obviously built to the surface. So the materials that are taken down beneath the surface are really small 